Dobar dan i dobrodošli na MBA Open Days Zagrebačke škole ekonomije i menadžmenta. Moje ime je Mario Vlaković, vojiteljica sam marketinga na Zagrebačku školi ekonomije i menadžmenta i čas mi je što smo se ukupili u ovom Zoom, na ovom Zoom eventu u ovako velikom broju. Upravo zbog velikog broja sudionika ovo, ovo događanje smo organizirali putem Zooma u obliku webinara i komunikacija se ovdje održava između penalista i publike na više načina. Možete u svojoj alatnoj traci na dnu ekrana vidjeti Q&A sekciju, chat i raise your hand ili podizanje ruke. Sve um, oblike komunikacije slobodno koristite. Mi vas pozivamo na aktivno sudjelovanje u ovom današnjem događanju. Jako nam je bitno vaše sudjelovanje, vaše mišljenje, komentari i pitanja ukoliko ih bude. A predstavila bih prije svega svoje kolege. S nama je danas ovdje prodekanica diplomskog MBA programa i zagledna profesorica, doktorica znanosti Maja Martinović. Prodekanica će... Pozdrav. Prodekanica će vam, se, će vam predstaviti diplomski MBA program Zagrebačke škole ekonomije i menadžmenta i mogućnosti studiranja koje se kod nas pružaju. Uh, Post-industrial leadership and art of the dialogue, tema je današnjeg stručnog predavanja s kojima ćemo započeti današnje druženje. Stoga vam predstavljam i izrednog profesora, doktora znanosti, Bornu Jelšenjaka, predavača Luksemburskola biznisa i Zagrebačke škole ekonomije i menadžmenta. Uh, dobar dan svima. Hvala. I evo ovaj, um, pozivam ujedno i profesora da nam se... Um, da nam pokrene svoju prezentaciju i da započne sa stručnim predavanjem. Hvala vam, Marija. Pozdrav prodekanice, pozdrav svi slušatelji. Prvo bi se htio zahvaliti na pozivu. Meni je uvijek veliko zadovoljstvo da imam neku publiku, jel? to ponekad ne bude najlakše doći do toga. Ja se nadam, to jest Marija mi je rekla da bi vam trebao prikazati nešto što može biti korisno, a malo i prezentirati neke vrijednosti koje se tiču menadžmenta, a do kojih nam je stalo na školi. I ja sam tako nešto pokušao u 20 minuta pripremiti za danas. A, pa bih vas molio, a, ako imate kakvih pitanja, ako osjetite da postajem pretehnički ili pre, pre malo možda tehnički, Slobodno me prekinite, kao što je rekla moderatorica, organizatorica, imate nekoliko načina na kojima možete dati do znanja da nešto želite reći. A, evo, a dok se vi lagano pripremate za današnji dan, ja ću pokušati dje, podijeliti svoju prezentaciju, pa možemo lagano krenuti. A, evo, evo, ja se ispričam, sam bi još dodala da imamo i um, sudjenike sa Louis Business school pa ako možemo... Ovaj, predavanje održati na engleskom jeziku. Um, that won't be any problem. Thank you, Maria, for letting me know that we have uh, non-Croatian speakers uh, in the room. Uh, thank you, and I will switch. Well, fortunately, my slides are already in English, so um, yeah, that was good planning on our side. Anyway, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Borna Jelšenjak. I'm a professor at Luxembourg School of Business. I'm an also adjunct faculty at Zagreb School of Economics and Management, and I teach leadership and ethics. Those two areas are my main area of research and, and work. Today, um, I wanted to share some of my ideas or some of my um, uh, things that I, I believe are extremely important for the work of uh, uh, the world of work today. And I'll try to Uh, keep it brief in, let's say, 20 or so minutes. Anyway, the today's topic is post-industrial leadership and the art of dialogue. Um, well, perhaps to start off, uh, let's talk, what do I mean when I say post-industrial leadership? Today, for the most part, uh, if you live in the Western world, uh, if you live in an Anglo-Saxon influenced world, you are probably working and living in a post-industrial era. Um, that means that we have to tackle many different uh, social variables, such as globalization, complexity, diversity, uh, huge, massive increase in technology and technological solutions. And of course, the way that we live our lives has changed. Uh, we don't live our lives in the West in the same way that our parents or our grandparents have lived. Um, I have to say that 
regarding the world of work, uh, that means several important things. Uh, first and foremost, when you were in the 50s of the 20th century, uh, what was considered leadership uh, was basically good management. People were expected to be supervised. Uh, people in place of, in positions of power were there because of their expertise and they were expected to know all the answers. And this was of course very suited for a world of work where industrial production was, um, uh, was dominant. Uh, but today, uh, in the face of all the different variables that I just mentioned today in the post-industrial era that we find ourselves in, this view on, on work and how work should be managed and how work should be led uh, doesn't seem to fit anymore. Uh, I do have to say, I do have to put in a slight uh, 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 defensive perimeter uh, uh, around my statements at this point. And I, that's why I have two pictures on my slide, which I hope you see. So uh, on the left-hand side, you see lady workers um, in a catering company during the first industrial revolution. This was in the UK, in the UK, long before the 20th century. But this is how catering industry, uh, they're actually canning food uh, on, in the picture. So this is how it looked like. So this I mean by industrial era. But if we look at the right-hand side of the screen, you have people sitting in a very uh, hygienic uh, conditions, almost thorough conditions. And it's not in the, during the first industrial revolution, it's three years ago. Those people are working at Foxconn in China and producing microchips for Apple phones, for iPhones, for computers and all those sorts of things. So I do have to say, or I do, I do have to put a slight defensive perimeter around my statements and say that while most of the work done today does not fit into the industrial era parameters anymore, there are still some industries which are pretty much the same uh, as they were a hundred years ago. But still, uh, being that we live in a certain context and we're part of certain cultures, uh, for us, uh, post-industrial era has definitely arrived. So anyway, when I talk about leadership and when I try to explain how we see leadership, um, I'm going to talk about the post-industrial, in the post-industrial context. Um, anyway, on this slide, you basically can see everything about how we consider what leadership is. Um, and I can stop my, 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 my session now. Uh, but what, what is important here and how we look at it, and this might be slightly different from when you type in what is leadership on Google. Uh, it's a very sexy concept these days and you'll get thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of hits if you search leadership on Google, as you know. Uh, but the way that we see it, the, the, the thing that defines what leadership is and how we teach it at Zagreb School of Economics and Management is that leadership has a goal, a very specific goal, and that goal is adaptive change. Uh, in a few minutes, I'll talk about adaptive change and explain what it is. But leadership is not a position, is not a title, is not something that you can um, be promoted into. Sure, you can have a title of leader, but that doesn't make you one. At least that's how we see it. The leadership is about action and a, action with a specific goal. And that goal is adaptive change. That goal is some change in thinking, in action, in attitude, in culture, or in strategy. It's not about how to fix a computer or which uh, software solution to use for video conferencing. It's about how do we implement video conferencing in our day-to-day -day activities. That's an adaptive change. Anyway, in order to achieve that adaptive change, communication should be important. So we also see leadership as a process which is interactive between leaders and people who might be considered as followers. I was speaking about, I was speaking about adaptive changes. So what do I mean by adaptive changes? Um, every company, it doesn't have to be a company. It can be an organization or an association. Every company faces two kinds of challenges. 
On one hand, it, in, it faces something that we call technical challenges, uh, and they are mostly connected to expertise. And uh, mostly people already have answers uh, or, or have ways to solve a technical challenge. Um, what I mean by this is, I don't think that every company should have a person knowing the answer uh, in house, but somewhere in the world, there is a person who uh, using his toolbox and his knowledge and expertise can solve a technical problem, right? Adaptive challenges are different. Adaptive challenges are more complex and they cannot be solved with a process, with a rule, with a tool. They have to, they, they concern systemic change. And as far, and of course, as we all know, people are always reluctant to change. And this leads me to what is a, the goal of leadership and why leadership work is about adaptive change. How do you influence a group of people to change their behavior, to change their culture, and to figure out solutions to face uh, to problems that an organization is facing that don't exist yet. That's work of leadership. That's not work of management. That's not work of technicians. That's, that's work of leadership. Perhaps just to illustrate this a bit more um, on a very simple problem that we were facing at ZSAM a couple of years ago. I don't know if you are aware, but we recently moved so we don't face that problem. But in our old campus, uh, we had problems with people who smoked. Uh, so they smoked cigarettes, students smoked cigarettes, some of the professors smoked cigarettes, and they would finish their cigarette and throw it on the ground, right? Uh, and that's a problem because someone has to clean it up. There's a mess, um, cleaning staff has extra work, and it's ugly. Let's be fair, it's ugly. By the way, I can say this because I'm a smoker as well, so I'm not uh, attacking people who smoke. Anyway, so what did ZSAM do? So changing the behavior of people not, not to throw cigarette butts on the floor when they're done and instead use the ashtray or the, the smoking points around campus, that's an adaptive challenge. That's a change in behavior. That's a change in custom. And that's something that people were resistant uh, about. So what did ZSAM do? Well, ZSAM had a brilliant idea. I was part of that, so again, I can say. It had a brilliant idea to print flyers saying, do not smoke outside of the designated areas. What do you guys think? Did that work? Of course not. I mean, we put the flyers all around the, the uh, the, the courtyard, and no one paid any mind to them. And why is that? Because ZCM approached adaptive challenge through a technical solution. Let's just give an order and people will stop. Well, obviously it did not stop. Fortunately for ZCM, the context changed, so we don't face that problem. But to be fair, we didn't uh, work we didn't, it wasn't our best moment in how to address the issue. So that would be a difference when, when I talk about technical and adaptive challenges. And precisely addressing adaptive challenges uh, is what I consider work or we consider work of, of leaders and leadership. And this is something that we talk about. I have to promote myself a little bit. So on the left, left hand side, you have my book that I uh, authored, co-authored with my uh, colleague and friend, Professor Ebner from the US, uh, who also teaches uh, leadership with us. Uh, so anyway, these are how to address technical issues uh, is something that we try to answer in our, uh, sorry, how to address um, adaptive changes or adaptive issues is something that we try to um, address in our leadership classes at Zagreb School of Economics and Management. And what we believe is, or what we strongly feel is that the work of management is about letting people, giving the people opportunity to engage in pursuing adaptive change, to engage in leadership. It's about opening doors. 
It's about making it easier. It's about provi providing a safety net so people can uh, try to achieve change uh, on the benefit of the whole organization and all stakeholders in it. But anyway, you do, and it's a tough work. It's not easy. And you do face problems. And we try to address those problems in, 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 uh, during our classes. One problem that you face or that everyone faces is, um, you have on one hand side, you have people telling to you, yes, uh, dialogue, communication, um, providing opportunities is a path towards adoptive change, right? And that's, I mean, that's fine, right? But everyone who has tried this will, will know that people fight constantly. So even if you try to do something, you will feel a uh, pushback. You will feel that there is a negative, uh, not a, uh, that, that people are not accepting your ideas and you, you uh, unavoidably get into conflict. So how do you resolve this or how do you try to resolve this? This is one of the topics that we discuss a lot in, the, uh, in our classes. So basically what we look at, we look at different conflict models and we, we try to see how to manage or what might be good ways to manage the conflict. Con the problem with conflict is that you experience something as an individual and you react to something as, as you, while the other person can see the same thing quite differently. And you're facing the same facts, it's the same situation, but two opposing sides in conflict can interpret and of course, react very differently. I'm sure that you will find found yourself in a situation when you were thinking that you did the right thing and that you're trying to help, but you, the other person, didn't see it that way. So basically, that's a difference in interpretation of someone's intentions. And this happens in conflict all the time. So how do you, or how, what, what might be one of the ways uh, to address this? Well, first and foremost, not all conflicts are the same, right? Not all conflicts are the same. On one hand, you can have a conflict about factual things. And those things can be like, what, what is the time, right? No, it's, uh, what is it? 321. No, it's 322, right? So you can have a conflict about facts. But those conflicts are pretty much, uh, they can be solved in pretty much... Um, easy in an easy way because you look at something that you find objective and relevant and you figure it out right much more difficult type of conflict is when you there's a conflict about uh, ideals about a perception how things should be done and what is the best way to do it right uh, uh, and who should do it right that there's always a problem when speaking about individuals, right? Anyway, so that's a much harder, much harder challenge than a factual conflict. Anyway, what we propose is something that our, our, our dear friend, Professor Richards from San Ambrose created, and this is what we practice, is a three-part meeting model in which we try to simulate a conversation, or si uh, not a conversation, but a conflict, and try to resolve it using uh, open-ended questions. So listening before stating your views. Then after all this, presenting your own views in an assertive and queer way. And finally, merging the perspectives using neutral language. This usually, so this process, why do we first ask and listen and not tell us time? Oh, because if you're ready to listen to another person before you, you you say what you have to say, uh, the other person is more willing to listen to you, right? The other person feels more appreciated. So it just makes it easier um, in a way to, 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 to deal with the tension that conflict has, right? And then eventually you have to present your own view. And in doing that, you have to be direct and you have to be assertive. Uh, when I say assertive, I don't mean rude. I just mean putting your views uh, in a clear way, uh, presenting your views in a clear way to, uh, to another person. And finally, since we all have to work together, right? 
and collaboration requires trust, um, you have to find some sort of a common ground. The funny thing with collaboration and trust is that the more you collaborate, the more trust, uh, the more trust you have in the person or in a group. And the more trust you have in a person or a group, you will collaborate more. So there's in some sort of a reciprocal relationship, right? Unfortunately, when one goes down, the other one necessarily goes down as well. So we have to be careful about that. The way to preserve trust and collaborate and improve collaboration is merging perspectives. And in this way, try to talk about, um, uh, about the conflict in a neutral way, try to differentiate between the person, the, the disagreements you have or we have with a person and disagreements that we have uh, with the task and how the task should be done. Uh, so this is something to have in mind. Anyway, this is what we practice when we do it. And on a final note, uh, one of the tools that we use uh, when we try to build leaders tool set uh, and of course mindset to, to actually practice those is something that we call the wheel of fire. And this is the last thing I would like you to I would like to leave you with uh, many people during the conflictual situation or when trying to uh, address adaptive change, adaptive challenge, which has many facets, which has many uh, different, um, uh, different parts to it, right? Uh, they have a hard time navigating what to put their focus on, uh, what seems to be most important. And this is one tool that we train uh, our students in uh, called the wheel of fire. It comes from the world of coaching. It's basically a, a, a pie chart uh, where you, and you can do this by yourself, right? It can be a self exercise as well. So basically what you do is you have eight sections on, on the wheel and you create the worst or you think about the worst possible things that you find in your organization or in your life. I mean, complete hell, right? It's, it's, it's devastation, it's, it's terror, it's frightening, it's stupid. Anything that, that you think is, belongs in hell, right? And then from there, once you have those down, you move on to something uh, that would be a complete ideal, complete different, completely different from those. So let's say it's not a hell wheel anymore, it's a heaven's wheel. So what would be the complete opposite? complete uh, uh, perfection regarding those things, right? And of course, the ideal is something that is always out of reach, but it's our goal, something to strive for and something to work towards, right? So anyway, uh, 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 you can write down the opposites of whatever you identified as the problems, right? And then you would pick one, to let's say three things on the wheel of uh, the heavenly wheel, the good wheel, you would pick three things uh, which seem most important or most relevant or something that is attainable to you or your team, right? And from there, from there, you would uh, uh, figure out ways or you would think about either as an individual or as a group, how to move closer to them. And what is important here, and this is something that I always like to, 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 to close with, uh, whatever you write down, I mean, whatever makes sense to you as, and is within your realm of possibilities, that's good, right? But it should be, uh, there should be things you can do almost immediately. So for me, I'm, not a very physically active person, right? So when I say I need to exercise, I need to start exercising, I think about, let's say six months from now after winter, because, hey, no one starts exercising before Christmas. That doesn't make sense because I'll, I'll wear coats all the time anyway. So, but that's not the point, right? There should be an actionable item to move us closer to what we want, right? Uh, and something that we can do today or within a week, within a couple of days. And this is how you closely, slowly move from the wheel of fire and the absolutely horrible situation that people are in uh, towards 
a heavenly ideal, which we will never reach, but in the process, we'll make a lot of things better. I believe that this can help either teams or individuals to resolve conflict and to move towards adaptive changes, right? Address adaptive challenges. And that means actually to practice leadership. And I'm here for all questions and comments. I hope you enjoyed it. I tried to keep it brief, uh, but I'm here for all further discussions or, or, or impressions. And Maria, back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. It was a very interesting uh, lecture. Well, you have to say that now. No, we'll see I don't what you say later. <laughs> no, no, it was. I was just thinking about what can I do today and what can I do in the next few days. So I'm, I'm sure you, you have stuff. I have a to do list here. Yeah. <laughs> so right. thank uh, maybe you. some of thank you, Professor. Maybe some of the participants want to share their opinion about this. Uh, do we have some questions, um, comments? What do you think about the lecture? Uh, feel free to um, write it down in the chat or in Q&A section. Yeah. Of course, you can say all the good, st good stuff now and forget about the bad comments. That's also fine. So we have one, uh, uh, one comment. It was a very interesting uh, lecture. Thank you, Professor Yalshenyak. And who, who said it? Sorry. It was Frane. Frane. Hi, Frane. Thank you for the Frane Kukura, thank you for the comment. I appreciate it. Uh, you, uh, if you or anyone else wish to converse more on it, Maria has my contact. I would be more than happy uh, to uh, converse further on this topic. Yeah. Thank you, Professor. Now, uh, if, uh, if we have more questions, sorry. Uh, how do you solve <laughs> issue? A very good question, uh, Maya. Uh, I see your question in the in the comments. We didn't solve it. We earthquake <laughs> earthquake destroyed our old campus and we moved. Okay. <laughs> to do. Do we have more questions? What does to do mean? What does to do mean? Ah, thank you. Okay. Okay. So uh, the professor will be with us um, uh, until uh, the end of this event. So if you have more questions for professor, feel uh, free to ask uh, during the, uh, after the presentation that is going to uh, start right now with our uh, y, uh, associate dean, professor uh, Maya Martinovic. Uh, so for now, we still have uh, some participants that do not speak uh, Croatian, so the presentation uh, is here and our vice dean is, uh, is ready. Thank you, Maria. Welcome. Uh, hvala, ja ću znači održati prezentaciju sad na engleskom jeziku, ali ako imate nekakvih pitanja na hrvatskom, slobodno možete i na hrvatskom pitati. Uh, so now I will show you a new campus. <laughs> And uh, I will tell you more about our MBA in general. If you have any questions, you can uh, write me in a chat or ask me later, whatever uh, is uh, just fine. So uh, here you can see our new campus, uh, um, our building, living room, classrooms. And uh, we always starting our presentations with our mission statement because ZSEM is a mission driven institution. And that's the reason why we have a strong, I will say strategy pillars and everything else around quality, which is the reason that we received several accreditations also. So here in the mission statement, as you can see, we are always talking about the values and uh, besides that, knowledge and skills of our students uh, because everything around that, it's a very important for long-term success in a globalized world. Undergoing constant technological and market transformation. Uh, when we talk about the values, we are taking care of uh, ethical and corporate social responsibility issues in each matter. 
And also at MBA, we are sharing knowledge in marketing, management, accounting, auditing, finance, uh, supply chain uh, management, human resources, IT, and other business aspects. And also when we talk about the skills, uh, we are uh, very aware that MBA level uh, requires also skills in a, as a um, teamwork, uh, then a leadership skills, uh, communication skills, oral and written communication. So these aspects are also something which we have uh, in our courses. <clears throat> we are also using uh, lots of new uh, technological possibilities such as uh, online uh, aspect of each course. Uh, we have a model as a platform which supports all our courses and also we are using a lot of simulations uh, games and similar in uh, our courses uh, as i told you we received accreditations and one of the most important all around the world in uh, business education is uh, acsb accreditation which we received in 2013 and since that, we are also re-accredited by ACSB, and that is uh, very important. I will say globally, that's the reason why we have a, a lot of uh, international partners, and uh, that is something which is uh, very important for all the students who want to like uh, work or study abroad. And uh, also, we are very proud that we are ranked uh, by QS at the uh, World University Rankings and also by Ed Universal uh, as a top business school. Um, also very important is uh, domestic accreditation, national accreditation by Agency for Science and Higher Education. And uh, we are accredited by agency two years ago and after that, we also had an audit from the same agency where we achieved like uh, uh, excellent grades for each standard. Uh, maybe uh, some uh, people think that those accre accreditations are not uh, so important, but in comparing the systems in education, that is one of, I will say, uh, the most important differentiation. Uh, our system is a solid firm and uh, quality in each, in each aspect is leading our system and that is our um, differentiation from other schools in a region. And uh, today I will present you um, our study programs. We have three undergraduate programs economics and management, business law and economics, business mathematics and economics. And then we have a graduate program, MBA program. And today I will present you more that program with 60 ECTS credits and the length of one year. And then we have also Doctor of Business Administ Administration, that is a DBA program in uh, cooperation with Sheffield Hallam University. And that is a program for all the candidates who would like to uh, achieve more in this uh, sector of education. So let's start with the MBA program. As I said, that is a one year program with 10 courses and two elective courses, which is optional. Then we are using both like Hrvatski and English language. So you can uh, write a final thesis in Croatian also, and also other uh, like um, works such as seminars, and similar, and mi koristimo oba jezika i u nastavi, i u prezentaciji, i u pisanim radovima i tako dalje. Academic title here, it's a Master of Business Administration, MBA, and the level, it's a seven level of European qualification framework. Uh, enrollment requirements, that is usually 
240 ECTS, that is a European Credit Transfer System points, or 180 for the candidates with um, other types of diploma. And those candidates also are passing then differentiated year of 60, 60 ECTS. In our program, we have uh, lectures, case studies, we are using simulations, and as I, as I already said, we are using uh, Moodle as an e-learning platform and support for all our courses. Um, we are trying to uh, achieve like uh, uh, real, real um, discussions in, in our classrooms and also we are using lots of examples, small case studies. Uh, then from uh, like lots of courses, we are using simulations which are presenting the, the business world as a real in some aspects. For example, we are using simulations in marketing, in uh, management, uh, we have a capstone simulation, we have an HR simulation and et cetera. Uh, for all our students, uh, we have also ebook library, and then we have a library with uh, all the literature with some uh, basis, uh, scientific basis uh, for, for their written works. That is a web of science, Scopus and EBSCO basis. And uh, let's just few words more about enrollment requirements. We have two different uh, possible participants. And if you have any specific questions about that, you can uh, just ask us. But in general, we have a students with the undergraduate and or graduate economic study programs and in uh, students from non-economic area or areas, because we have a lot of, uh, for example, lawyers, uh, professors of languages, then uh, uh, engineers, uh, doctors, medical doctors, I mean, also PhDs in some aspects, uh, from agriculture to the tourism or uh, uh, education, health, from all the uh, business fields, the uh, students are coming. And then if they are not from non-economic area, they have that one semester of introductory with five courses. That is a marketing, principles of marketing, principles of management, principles of finance, accounting, and economy. And after that, then they are ready to uh, enter the, the graduate MBA program with, with all other students, which are already from economic uh, area. So, uh, that is that, and also we have some additional um, content for the students who got 180 ECTS credits. So all the all the uh, all those uh, possible participants are, um, um, I will say, welcome to our program. And uh, for each of them, we have a specific track. In uh, our MBA concentrations, you will find seven, seven different, um, I will say, uh, profiles. Uh, one is more in accounting, audit, and taxes. Then one is finance and banking. Then we have a human resource management. Then management, marketing, supply chain management, and the last one is a tourism, hospitality, and events. Besides that, we have also two uh, different concentrations, such as executive MBA and global executive MBA, which I will tell more uh, about later. So when we talk about th these seven different uh, concentrations, they are actually different specializations in the different areas of business administration. And the lectures for all of them are usually from Monday to Friday, from 5 to 9 p.m. And for executive and global executive, 
we have lectures usually during the weekend that the weekends that means like friday afternoon and a saturday whole day uh, and that is uh, more more suitable for the students who are coming from abroad from from like other cities in croatia or or in from e area and um, when we look at a mba timeline uh, from the lectures with the, as I told you, uh, lots of simulations, case studies, the lecturers or professors are uh, our colleagues from uh, Croatia and abroad. So each, uh, each course got, a, I will say, two uh, professors and you can also uh, then, uh, as I told you, uh, write some some work, some some like uh, topics or theses in a Croatian or in English, and then uh, uh, actually in those lectures we are using uh, the help or support or uh, cooperation with our um, uh, I will say lecturers from the business world. So uh, that is a nice. Uh, cooperation between a scientific and business uh, surroundings. And in all uh, that surroundings, we are using lots of practical um, tools and uh, lots of practical examples to um, explain the business environment in each of those fields. So. In, in it's the same in a marketing, in a management, in a finance, and a similar. And in all those concentrations, students are uh, networking, uh, and they they are like uh, uh, con they have a constant conversation uh, between each other. They work in a teams, and networking it's a very important aspect of all all the. Uh, MBA program. And also the one of the very important possibility is a student exchange. And then uh, also we have uh, two elective courses which student can choose as an optional. And internship is a very important part of the whole story. And at the end of this timeline, we have a graduate thesis. I will say something more about this thesis and uh, and the uh, um, student exchange and the internship later. And uh, maybe it's just a few words first about the executive and global executive MBA. As I told you, that is uh, during, the, uh, during the weekend. And uh, here we have 10 courses, that is uh, 20 weekends and 12 months. In a global executive MBA, students are also visiting our partners in Italy, that is H Farm, our partner in um, Italy, and then uh, partners in Luxembourg Business School and also in Singapore. And that is the reason why that is a global executive MBA. So, uh, but I will say that uh, for both these concentrations, the most important is that uh, here, we are uh, like um, we created the program for the students participants who are uh, not able to attend classrooms every day just for weekends and then to uh, all um, our candidate candidates our students we are offering uh, possibilities to go all around the world uh, by support of our international office. Uh, as you can see here, we have 150 partner universities all around from Asia, Europe, North America, South America, Australia, Africa. And uh, that is one of uh, biggest advantages, I will say, of the ZSEM MBA program. In this story, we have few 
uh, options uh, called like uh, additional degree programs. As you can see here, five institutions with uh, several concentrations are also uh, something which is very popular, uh, I will say, in, in our student body. And uh, this is possibility that you can achieve one degree program here in Croatia and also by some of our international partners from Catch Business School, uh, then uh, in France, then as you can see in Taiwan, Japan, and Netherlands and China. And uh, all our students are supported by Career Center also. And the Career Center is a center for all our alumni. And today we have 2,800 successful alumni and uh, in all, these, in all the, these firms. And also we are working with all these firms in some of the projects. And uh, uh, Career Center is in charge of organizing networking, then uh, workshops, uh, like some projects, and they are uh, helping our students in a career development. And at the end of this presentation, maybe you can see like some uh, testimonials from our students. For example, Milan is talking about the um, like uh, intensive group projects because usually at MBA, we have a, also group projects and that's the way how our students can pass their exams. Uh, on some courses. And um, I will say just that um, uh, you can see here that uh, that is the other testimonial, which is about the uh, uh, like uh, cooperation with the colleagues from Europe, America, Australia, I Asia, and all around the world. I will say that uh, this last year uh, with the um, uh, this uh, lockdown and uh, some uh, problems, I will say issues or uh, challenges, not the problems in, in uh, delivering the programs, uh, that, that was also in some aspects uh, advantage because we, that was the way to actually include all uh, around the world students and professors to cooperate in our uh, in our programs and uh, that was also one interesting experience and that is something which uh, we will choose today uh, also to um, like a very good additional uh, part of each program. Uh, today uh, we are like uh, uh, teaching in, in the classrooms again, but we are able to uh, be connected with the professors, our colleagues from all around the world. Um, and that is interesting in cooperation, in presenting some international cases and to uh, actually give our students some a taste of global economy and global business. So that is the um, uh, end of uh, my presentation. Actually, maybe now you can see just few uh, graduate thesis topics here, because uh, with this slide, we would like to show you that our students are producing something very useful, something which can use for their businesses, for their careers, and uh, our mentors, our professors can support and direct them to um, like write uh, that thesis at the end, something uh, useful for, for, uh, for them. So we are always supporting uh, applicable, applicable thesis, applicable knowledge, and that is one of uh, very uh, strong advantages of this program, I will say. And that will be uh, end of my short presentation, I hope. <laughs> and uh, if you have any uh, questions, you can like write me an email here. You have my 
uh, email address or you can just ask right just right now uh, so the floor is yours thank you very much thank you professor it was a very nice presentation we already have some first questions but uh, this is also an opportunity for all of you uh, participants to ask more questions so please use chat q and a and if you want to raise your hand we can also allow you to speak so please and so the question was when does uh, global executive mba starts uh, you planned it for um, uh, october uh, have you enrolled the first generation on gemba on global executive mba mm -hmm. okay uh, actually we are just starting with the global executive mba and that is the first uh, group uh, starts this year and that is our new concentration so that is very accurate question question i will say and uh, so if you are interested in global mba you can start today <laughs> because i think that they are traveling in italy tomorrow. <laughs> yes tomorrow <laughs> tomorrow it's the first first course starting we are starting with the first course but um, maybe it's also interesting that uh, we have for, uh, in each of these specializations we have actually um, two um, date of enrollments so you can enroll now or or you can enroll also on um, um, january february uh, why January, February? Because we are starting with our next enrollment and next class uh, uh, at the end of the February. But uh, uh, before that, we have a pre-semester for all students who are non, uh, who are not from non, uh, who are not from economic area, and uh, it's the same if you will start now or then, why? Because we have actually something like uh, two semesters. So if you will start with the first or the second, it's, it's the same. That semester will be first for you when you will start. And uh, so uh, that is something which uh, enables us to have two uh, enrollments per year. Uh, so uh, we we are usually starting with the old concentrations in uh, at the beginning of September and uh, in uh, February also. So so that is uh, that is that. Maybe we started with this uh, global MBA this year uh, like uh, later because the students are traveling just tomorrow to Italy. That is that. Thank you. And each in each concentration got uh, its own schedule. And uh, also maybe it's a very important to know that all all classes are in modules. That means that when you finish one module, one course, then you are passing your exam and you are starting with the other course and then passing the second exam so that is a uh, that is how uh, the whole um, like uh, program is stru structured okay, thank you professor uh, the next next question is uh, you mentioned double degree programs uh, how do they work in practice uh, when students are fully employed okay uh, maybe also Maria can help me, but I will start. Uh, <laughs> yes, we already had um, all our MBA students are employed. Most of them, 90% of the students are employed and uh, they are still going on uh, double degree programs because if you choose a double degree in Cage Business School in France, in Bordeaux, then you have to go uh, first semester, semester, you have to be here on ZSCM. It is a fall semester and the next semester, so the spring one, you have to go to a catch business school in France, but the semester is full, it is a full-time program and it lasts for 10 weeks. 
So usually when the employer employee wants to go, then the company uh, supports that and they find a way to do it. Whether it is like three days, three weeks, <laughs> or mm -hmm. um, a remote, uh, or the employees is doing uh, from from cage remotely. Nowadays, uh, uh, during the pandemic, we all showed that it is possible. So there are um, lots of um, ways to do it. Uh, also, uh, the French is very um, prospective country, and there are lots of um, good companies. So maybe for your company, it is interesting to go to for example, Cage, because there are some partners, there are some uh, other companies that you work with and uh, you can do uh, your work from there or from Tilburg or from some other universities that we have double degree program or exchange program in general. Mm. You're a professor, but <laughs> you can add. Bravo, Maria. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions for me? <laughs> So we had some, um, uh, usually the students are going to CAGE business school because CAGE, uh, on the CAGE, at, one, at once CAGE, CAGE business school can accept 10 our, our students and uh, other uh, partners can accept four students at once. Mm -hmm. So, and also the students from those partner universities are coming on double degree programs to Zagreb School of Economics and Management. So it works both ways. So I'm doing in mar I'm working in marketing. We did not. <laughs> I know. Uh, I know that the, the double double degree programs are very pop popular in general, and uh, it's always like uh, when we have a quote for for those students, it's always cool, and uh, uh, the students are like uh, very interesting in in uh, all those double degree, degree programs because that is maybe like some more works but a uh, huge, huge advantage also. Yeah. Really. With two diplomas and international experience that is something which is amazing really, yeah. yeah. So we do not have more questions. Um, do you, Professor, want to add something, Gorna? Uh, well, I would just, uh, I would just wanted to say thank you. I once again thank you for inviting me. I hope you found my talk useful, and I'm looking forward to seeing you uh, live <laughs> on campus. Yeah, yeah. I uh, I would also like to thank you all for uh, today's participation. Uh, we will send you uh, an email with um, the, the video of the presentation of the event. Okay. And uh, we are here also for the individual meetings, for school visit, uh, for any questions you have. We can uh, do it through email, uh, phone, or in, in person on our campus or on coffee near your work place. So please feel free to contact us uh, in person. Thank you for participation. Thank you, Associate Dean, Professor Martinovic. Thank you, Professor Elsenyak, for the um, lecture you um, held for us today. And we'll be uh, here also next month with a new uh, topic. So please stay in touch with us. Follow our news on uh, www.zsm.hr and social networks also. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.